All right. Good morning. Uh, this week, uh, we are going to conclude looking at wisdom found in the book of Proverbs that is specifically directed toward parents. Um, last week, we actually had a first time visitor to the church. His name was Brandon. And he shouted out a question smack dab in the middle of the sermon, which was unexpected, but I, I'm actually fine saying that it was great. Um, most churches, as you can imagine, would not put up with that type of a thing happening, but we definitely don't mind if someone who's new and is questioning what's being taught from the pulpit uh, and has a question. So what Brandon asked about, for those of you that weren't here, is he asked about the other side of discipline, meaning what should we do for our children when they obey, and what should we do for our children when they do the right thing? That makes sense, the opposite of discipline. And I think the motivation behind his question is that we should be rewarding our children when they do the right thing and not just disciplining them when they do the wrong thing. Well, obviously, when you get a random question shouted out at you while you're preaching, it's unexpected and you're kind of caught off guard. So this past week, just throughout the week, random times, I had a chance to actually dwell on his question. And I have created some additional thoughts that I would like to add uh, this morning. So number one, it's important to remember that in raising children, what we're doing is we're actually preparing them for the real world. That's what we're doing. We're preparing them for when they're no longer underneath our roof, underneath our authority, and literally have to survive in the real world without us. And so, if you will, we're, we're actually raising adults if we look at it in that uh, mindset. We're, we're raising adults, and we want to make sure that uh, they're where they need to be and where we want them to be when they reach that stage. And so this week, it actually occurred to me that in the real world, punishments and consequences await you when you do the wrong thing, but there isn't a reward for doing the right thing in the real world. So let me give you some examples. If you drive safely, so for example, you don't run red lights, there's no special reward for that. It's simply avoiding the consequences of running the red light that you get for doing the right thing. You avoid the tickets you can get from running a red light, and you avoid the potentially serious accident that you could cause for yourself or someone else if you run a red light. How about paying your bills, right? The same is true if you pay your bills on time. There's no reward for paying your bills on time. And again, what you avoid is you avoid the consequences of not paying your bills, which can be having your water turned off, having your car repossessed, or having your home foreclosed on. How about paying your taxes, right? You don't get your taxes reduced. You don't get special treatment by paying what you legally owe in taxes. Rather, you avoid the consequences of not paying your taxes, which is an IRS audit, monetary penalties, interest, even jail time. So since we are training our children for the real world, it's important to teach them that the true benefit of obeying and the true benefit of doing the right thing is avoiding the consequences that come with disobedience. That right there, trust me, that right there is truly enough motivation to do the right thing, avoiding punishment. Now, you might recall multiple times in the Bible, God says that the death penalty will actually cause people to not do those things which carry the death penalty as punishment. Deuteronomy 13 and Deuteronomy 17 are a couple of, of examples where God says, you shall put a man to death, and the result is, all Israel shall hear and fear, 
and not again do such wickedness as this among you. That's Deuteronomy 13, 11. As I mentioned last week, we can begin to train our children to obey and to avoid doing things that would put them in harm's way while they are still nursing infants. We can start that young. The, the sooner we can start training our children that life is more enjoyable and peaceful when they do the right thing and obey, the quicker they will understand that making the right choice is better for everyone, but especially for them. One other item I would like to note. Where do we find a real world example where obedience is a life and death situation? There's probably many examples, but I think the best example might be the military. Okay, think about it, the military. And since the real world contains many life and death scenarios, I think the military is a fantastic example to look at for tips on parenting, on how to raise your children. The reason the military is so adamant about obedience and specifically immediate obedience is because war is a life and death matter. Now, I've never been in the military, so I'm not even speaking from experience here, but it's obvious that their methods, meaning the military's methods, are very intentional and with good reason. They're not arbitrary. When they say attention, you must immediately drop everything and get into position. If they tell you to do something, you respond with, yes, sir, and you do it immediately. All of that is training to understand, to re respect your superiors, and to respond immediately because a delay in combat could mean death. Now, we're not training our children for a literal war, but the world is a very evil place. And it's important to teach our children and our kids to respond with, yes, dad, and yes, mom, and to do what we ask of them in short order, meaning without delay. So I'll just give one example of this with our own children, and then we'll dive into the book of Proverbs. So I'm guessing this isn't just our kids, but kids seem to love to ask the question, why? They love the question, why? And when do they love that question, especially when we ask them to do something, right? So we decided, my wife and I, we decided as parents that we did not want to tell them that they are not allowed to ask why, because life, especially childhood, is about learning. And it's, if you think about it, it's actually about learning the why behind everything around them. So we taught, our kid, we taught our kids this. When mom or dad asks you to do something, you must first say, yes, mom, or yes, dad, in order to acknowledge that you were spoken to and acknowledge that we were heard. And next, you begin to do what was asked of you. So let's just throw out an easy example. Uh, taking the trash out in the kitchen because mom is cooking and it's overflowing. And so after you've responded with yes mom or yes dad and begin to obey and start taking the trash, trash out, then you can ask why. That is the moment if you want to ask why you can do that. Now this has been a great way to instill obedience into them while also not being a parental dictatorship where they must obey everything we say without reason or understanding or questioning. So last week, we finished up in, in Proverbs with Proverbs 13, 24, which said, if we love our children, we discipline them promptly. As it's, and the reason for this was it's important to make sure that their less than fully developed brains make the connection between what they did wrong and the punishment they are receiving. 
Very, very important part of discipline. Now, Proverbs offers more wisdom as to exactly what discipline is. So let's turn to Proverbs chapter 22. In verse 15 of Proverbs 22, we learn not only how to discipline, but what purpose this method of discipline has. So verse 15 says this, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So this verse tells us something about the nature of our children. And that is the fact that they do not have wisdom naturally. They are going to make mistakes. They are going to do foolish things. As a reminder, someone who is not wise is a fool. A fool lacks wisdom. That's what a fool is. And so as we raise our children and as we impart wisdom into their lives, especially biblical, godly wisdom, such as that found in Proverbs, they will, over time, become less and less foolish. And this verse, Proverbs 22, 15, does not say that the way to remove foolishness from our children is to wait until they are older and sophisticated and can understand logic and reason, and you can simply impart wisdom to them from your mouth to their ear. No, this verse says the rod of correction will drive it far from him. It is foolishness. The rod of correction will drive foolishness far from your child. By the way, I love the word drive. In this context, it means to eliminate. It means to rid of, to make as far away as possible. If you're a sports guy, you can imagine a, a golf drive off the tee, okay? And just in, envision driving foolishness that far away from your child. If you're not a sports guy, just think of all the times in the Bible where God says he will drive out the enemy nations so Israel can inhabit their promised land. When God made that promise, he wasn't painting a picture where he would just move them out of the way a little bit. No, he was going to completely remove them and drive them out of the land either by killing them or they could go and relocate to a completely different country. The rod of correction mentioned here must be used as a foundational method of punishing children. It's foundational. Now, this can be a belt. It can be a switch. could even be a cooking spoon. We have many great, easily accessible items today uh, that we can use as a rod of correction. And guess what? They all work great. They all work great. But if we do not use a rod to correct, do not expect the foolishness to be driven far away from your child, because that's exactly what this verse tells us will do it. Now, the next verses from Proverbs are some of the most intense, in-your-face truth regarding disciplining children. And by the way, I think sometimes we, we just need to hear it straight. And, and God gives it to us straight here, okay? Proverbs chapter 23, we're going to look at verses 13 and 14. Starting with verse 13, we read this. Do not withhold correction from a child, for if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. You shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. It does not get any more straightforward than this. As we just read in the previous chapter, Proverbs 22, correction is done with the rod. Remember, the rod of correction. So first and foremost, Proverbs 23 is commanding us to not withhold correction. 
And so people are going to be tempted to think that they are correcting their children because they count to three or they put them in time out or they take away their favorite toys for a time or something other, anything other than what God instructs us exactly to do. No, when it says do not withhold correction, it is saying do not withhold the rod of correction. Do not withhold spanking your children. And why is this? The verse continues. For if you beat him with a rod, he will not die. Finish this famous phrase for me, please, out loud. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. So much of the world's wisdom actually comes from the Bible, and people don't even realize that. Now, we know in our own lives that the times that we experienced pain, sometimes severe pain, those instances taught us our greatest lessons. <clears throat> when I first hit my finger with a hammer, trying to hammer a nail, you can bet that I put way more focus when hitting a nail from that point on and there's not a time I hammer a nail without thinking to myself, to this day, I really don't want to hit my finger right now. Now, that did not come from someone teaching me that it would hurt to hit my finger. No, that came from experience. And nothing would have helped me understand that better than experience. I had to feel that one to take it that seriously going forward for the rest of my life. My son, Gavin was riding his small electric dirt bike with shorts on, and he crashed, and he ripped open his knee. And this is a bad one, okay? This is not a cut, okay? This was a tear. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure you could see some ligaments, some tendons, and maybe even a little bone in there. I wasn't willing to dig around, but I'm pretty sure that was there. So when I took him to the emergency room, they actually peeled back the flap, it was a flap, and they showed me what was underneath, and it was actually full of rocks down in there. And they were explaining to me what they were going to have to do. This was a bad one. And I can tell you right now that Gavin has never, not once, mounted that dirt bike since then without thinking of that crash. First thing that comes to his mind. And he knows immediately, before he gets on, that if he wears jeans or knee pads, that injury will most likely not happen again. There's undoubtedly a seemingly infinite number of examples in our lives. You're probably thinking of examples right now where pain caused you to learn a lesson, and that has been the single greatest motivator for you not to make that same mistake again. What doesn't kill us can definitely make us stronger. And the Bible reminds us that the rod of correction is not going to kill our child. Now, obviously, beating someone with a rod can kill them, right? So what this is letting us know is it's actually teaching us how we should spank our children. And it's not beating them over the head or causing permanent damage to their bodies. A good spanking, a good one, pales in comparison to all the scrapes and cuts and bruises our kids will obtain through falls and sports and climbing trees and everything else that they do as kids. And even though a spanking does not draw blood or hurt nearly as bad as all these other normal parts of childhood, guess what? It still works. It still works. I still remember spankings I received as a child, and the pain lasted for seconds, and the really big spankings lasted for just minutes. That's it. But it works. The pain, albeit brief, is enough to act as a motivator and as a deterrent for our children, and it prepares them for the real world where the punishment and consequences are way more severe. Proverbs gives us one more verse 
concerning the rod of correction. And it's a really good reminder for us parents, especially you moms out there. Go ahead and turn to Proverbs chapter 20. Verse 30 of Proverbs 20 tells us this. Blows that hurt cleanse away evil, as do stripes the inner depths of the heart. So our kids are very honest, and they've admitted to my wife and I, especially recently, that mom's spankings don't hurt. That is a problem, okay? A spanking that doesn't hurt is not really a spanking at all. As we read here, and I want you to really pay attention to this, blows that hurt cleanse evil. Wow. That's a very powerful testimony against evil. No one wants their child to grow up and become evil. We don't want our children to become murderers or rapists or child predators. And we learn here that painful punishment can actually cleanse away evil itself. So, so powerful. And the second half of the verse, stripes cleanse the inner depths of the heart. Again, incredibly powerful. We don't want our children to obey simply for the sake of obeying and still be rotten or evil inside. This is a heart matter, right? That's what it comes down to. This is a heart matter. We want our children to not only fix their actions, but we want them to fix their heart as well. And so painful spankings have the power, according to Proverbs, God's wisdom, painful spankings have the power to reach even the inner depths of the heart. What is stripes referring to here? Well, that's referring to the remnants of the spanking. When our body feels pain, just generally, significant pain, there's almost always going to be a remnant. This can be a, a tiny slice from a paper cut. It can be a scrape on your knee if you fall on the concrete, or it can be a bruise, say from getting hit by a ball or a puck. A painful spanking is going to leave a mark. Now, if you're using a switch, I imagine back when, you know, Proverbs was written, they used a twig or a stick of some form. That's going to leave a mark, and it's going to be in a straight line, and that line looks like a stripe. These marks mean that there was pain associated with the spanking. They're a reminder to your child that they were punished, and they should disappear in a day or two. Children's bodies heal very quickly. But please, please, see the wisdom here and what the rod of correction has the power to do. The rod of correction has the power to cleanse away evil and cleanse the inner depths of the heart. It does not get more important than that. One more very important piece of wisdom when it comes to parenthood is found in chapter 19 of the book of Proverbs. In verse 18 of chapter 19, we read this. Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. The wisdom in Proverbs is mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. I love it so much. There are two very important things here. First, it says that you must chasten your child while there is still hope. The dictionary defini definition of chasten means to correct by punishment or suffering. So I think it's safe to say that the dictionary definition of chasten falls in line with exactly what we've seen in the book of Proverbs in terms of discipline and correction of our children. But this says to chasten while there is still hope. This means you can actually wait too long before you begin disciplining your children. 
and waiting too long means that chastening will no longer work, hence the loss of hope. As I've mentioned a couple of times now, both last week and this week, the earlier you start training your children, the better. It's shocking to a lot of people, but when we explain it and we show them there are methods and there are ways to train even nursing infants that are extremely effective, and what they're doing is they're creating a fertile ground for future training and future correction. That's exactly what they're doing. Now, if you wait too long, you're going to create an environment where their will has become so strong because it has not had correction that you could find yourself in a situation where correction will no longer be effective. And this verse also says, Proverbs 19, 18, not to set your heart on your child's destruction. What does this mean? This means you must absolutely desire the best for your child, especially when it comes to discipline. Discipline must be in love. Discipline must be in love. You can't ever want to hurt your child. You can't ever want or feel the need to take out your anger on your child. Setting your heart on your child's destruction, which is what Proverbs 19.18 says not to do, means you want to see your child hurt or you want to see your child suffer consequences in the real world because they're out of control and disrespectful. We've all seen this, right? We've all heard other people talk about this. We've seen other parents that want them to experience something in the real world. That's not what we want or need for our children. So for example, I've, I've seen this many times. People want their children to have a run-in with authorities, with the police, in order to show them, right? Then they'll see, in order to teach them a lesson. That's a really bad situation. We have former police officers in the church congregation, and they can tell you that parents think that if their kids just end up having a run-in with the police, that that will fix the problem and that that will solve the problem and that the police officer will help them get their child straightened out. The reality is, if it gets to that point, then that means you as a parent did not do your job and it's probably too late. A police officer is not going to, <clears throat> uh, a police officer is not going to magically be able to undo the years and years of work that you did not do. That's not their job and it's definitely not going to be able to happen. Sorry, give me one second here. Press the wrong button. Correcting our children, spanking our children, is to avoid run-ins with the authorities when they're older. And so it must be done in love because we care about our children, because we want the best for our children. That is the definition of love. So to conclude, I want to return to a verse that we already looked at. Proverbs 23, 14, we, we read it quickly. It contains a statement that really encapsulates why we discipline our children. The reason, the true reason we discipline our children, and that is because we care about their eternal souls. That has to be the main reason. Personally, I cannot think of anything more important than making sure I do everything in my power as a parent to create an environment where my children will choose to love, respect, and fear God. Correction and discipline 
are some of the first things that we can do that the Bible tells us will actually have an effect on the eternal destiny of our children's souls. Going back to Proverbs 23, 14, God tells us through the wisdom of Solomon, you shall beat him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we're just so grateful for the freedom to fellowship and to get together on a weekly basis to praise you, to study your word, to learn from one another, to fellowship, and to just grow uh, in you through the body of Christ. And I just pray that uh, people understand the power in the wisdom that you have given us directly through your word. Uh, it's accessible to literally anyone on the planet today, anyone who becomes pregnant and becomes a parent and has to raise children. They have access to this incredible wisdom and you tell us exactly what to do. You're our maker, you created us, you designed us, you know what works and you know what doesn't. And I pray that uh, people see this because this is one of the first things that can happen in someone's life to put them on a path toward understanding that right and wrong exist, that you exist, and to hopefully one day trust in your son Jesus for their salvation. I pray this all in his name, amen.